Seamus. And Seamus has participated in many expeditions, both on an official level from the National Botanic Garden and on a personal level. And he's a well-known author as well. And you'll get to see Seamus every day in the gardens when he's here. He's a very, very hard worker and we're very proud of him. So without further ado, Seamus. Mary, thank you. So I'll share a screen. And I just want to echo Mary's uh, words of thanks uh, to uh, Mark. Mark, we're really grateful to you for giving up so much of your, of your private time and your personal time uh, to this evening. Uh, and uh, it's great also to, um, sorry, I'll just go back one. Um, to be able to collaborate with the Royal Horticultural Society's Rhododendron Camellia and Magnolia Group. As, as Mary and Mark have mentioned, we have branches right across the United Kingdom uh, and Ireland with membership right across the world. Various different branches. So if you're passionate about rhododendrons, please do look on, on our website. But for the moment, we are in Ireland and we're at the National Botanic Gardens of Ireland, uh, Kilmacurra. Uh, but we're focusing on uh, what we sort of sometimes jokingly call our mothership, and that is the National Botanic Gardens of Ireland, Glasnevin in Dublin. So this is a view of Glasnevin's uh, curvilinear range of glass houses, uh, one of the most important wrought iron Victorian conservatories in the world, uh, manufactured by Richard Turner in Dublin. Uh, in the mid 19th century. So Richard Turner is also responsible for the Great Palm House at Kew and the Great Palm House at Belfast uh, Botanic Gardens. Uh, it's one of the most iconic glass houses in the world and uh, it was uh, constructed under the supervision of one of our most famous directors, Dr. David Moore. And of course, the lecture is about the Moors of, of Glass Nevin. So, really, to um, understand uh, Glasnevin, we need to delve back into the 19th century. The gardens were established by the Royal Dublin Society in 1795. And the first source of rhododendrons was not China, but India. So of course, this was before China opened its bamboo curtain to uh, Western plant hunters. And Glasnevin's earliest source of rhododendrons was the subcontinent and Sri Lanka. This particular view I took, uh, Mark, you're probably familiar with this scene. I know you've been to Arunachal Pradesh, but this is the plains of Assam, and it's particularly tea on the, on the Assam plains. Um, the early Victorians uh, didn't really understand that beyond the plains of Assam lay these great mountain ranges, the, the Himalaya, and that was to become the early source of rhododendrons for British and Irish gardens, and particularly for the early influx of introductions to Glasnevin. One of our earliest great directors or curators was Ninian Niven. He was a Scot. He uh, really did raise the profile of the gardens at Glasnevin. And you can see that when you look in, this is the, the plant book or the, the record book in our rare book room at Glasnevin. It's 1836. And if you look very carefully, you can see that in 1836, we receive packets of seed of rhododendron arboreum from Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Um, and of course, rhododendron arboreum, this the, the, the type of species does not grow in Sri Lanka. Um, that, of course, was the original introduction of rhododendron arboreum subspecies Zeylanicum, which is endemic uh, to, to Sri Lanka. It's found in the Halton Plains and on uh, uh, Sri Prada, or Adams Peak. Uh, it's incredibly rare in gardens. On the entire island of Ireland, the only plants that grow on this island are here at Kilmacurra. So the seed of this rhododendron came through a wine merchant who was based in, in Dublin, and he passed the seed on to Glasnevin. Glasnevin was really building a reputation as a great place for uh, raising what considered difficult plants. David Moore, of course, was left with the dilemma that Glasnevin was based on a substrate that with a pH of 7.9. So incredible alkalinity, not at all suited uh, for, um, for growing rhododendrons and other ericaceous plants. So he began the policy of 
distributing rhododendrons and other irrigated plants from the gardens out to landed Irish estates in Britain and Ireland that had the better growing facilities but means to look after these plants. The Calcutta Botanic Gardens, the, the Royal Botanic Gardens Calcutta, became another major player. So it, of course, was the company's garden. It was established by the East India Company as a place to uh, experiment with plants that could improve improve the economy of British India and hence the empire. As And these were new economic plants. So they began the policy of sending out collectors into the Himalaya, particularly to... Um, to places like Nepal and Sikkim and Bhutan. And from Sikkim, or so I should say from Calcutta, seed was sent to places like Kew and Glasnevin and Edinburgh and distributed from there. So one of their early great superintendents, of course, was a Dane, Nathaniel Wallach. So many of you will grow in, uh, rhododendron Wallachii. But not just that, people like William Griffith of rhododendron Griffithianum fame, um, there's a, a whole plethora of great directors of, of that garden. It was the queue of Asia in its day and one of the main sort of uh, distribution centres of Himalayan rhododendron species from the early 19th century onwards. David Moore became our director at, at the Dublin Botanic Gardens in 1838. He was a Scot. He came to work in Ireland as part of the Ordnance Survey, um, basing himself in County Antrim in Counties Down and then moving down to manage the Trinity College Botanic Gardens in Fallsbridge in Dublin before taking on the mantle of, of Glasnevin. As I mentioned, his first major project was the construction of the curvilinear range of glass houses. So you can see here the curvilinear range in 1854. Um, this image appeared in the Illustrated London News. Um, it was for the, the visit of Victoria and Albert to Dublin in, in, sorry, in 1853. The houses have not yet been joined by interconnecting uh, corridors. Um, so David Moore uh, was to be our director uh, between 1838, right up to his death, sorry, not in 1979, in 1879. So the Moors were a force to be reckoned with. So it, it's a very similar parallel between the three former Royal Botanic Gardens, because, of course, Glasnevin, prior to independence, Ireland's independence in 1922, was a Royal Botanic Gardens, and it was a sister garden of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew in London and of the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, the parallels I talk about was the fact that you had the Hooker's father and son, Sir William Hooker at Kew, uh, Sir Joseph Dalton Hooker, his son obviously succeeded him at Kew, and then the Balfour's father and son uh, at Edinburgh. At Glasnevin, you had uh, David Moore, succeeded by his son, Sir Frederick Moore, but not just that, David Moore's brother was Charles Moore, who came over from Scotland, trained as an, a horticultural apprentice at the Trinity College Botanic Gardens before taking on the mantle of being director of the Royal Botanic Gardens uh, in, in Sydney in Australia. You can see in the bottom slide, that's the rhododendron garden that he established in pretty hot climate using azalea species. And of course, rhododendrons, of course, were amongst the most fashionable plants at that time. So here we are. So Again, as I mentioned, to understand the Moors, you need, you need to go into pre-independence days in Ireland. So Dublin is the second city of the British Empire. And within the British Empire, the three great botanic gardens of the age were uh, Kew, of course, was always sort of the main garden in, in London. And uh, it, it was said that the only garden that uh, could surpass last night in this queue, the only botanic garden that could equal it, of course, Royal Botanic Gardens at Edinburgh. Uh, and these are the three great palm houses of uh, the of the three gardens. Glass Nevins, which was built in 1884, uh, it came across in kit form from Scotland. Kews, which was built in Dublin, sent over in kit form from Dublin to London and, and Edinburgh. David Moore, of course, was at the centre of activity from, uh, 18, uh, from the 1830s at Glass Nevin. At this time, suddenly the Himalaya opens to the west. Um, it's being explored uh, by various different um, sort of people, people in colonial service in British India, but also soldiers 
And it's interesting to note that in 1745, fully 47% of the British army in India came from Ireland. And many of those people were very well educated. They had an interest, of course, in the strategics of mountain passes, and many of them had an interest in botany. The result of that, of course, was the exploration of these remote mountain passes, and that many of these soldiers and colonial administrators sent their seeds back to, to Dublin. One of the most famous of these was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Edward Madden. So Madden was born in County Kilkenny. Um, he uh, was had four tours of duty as a soldier with the Royal Bengal Alt Artillery. Um, this image, by the way, in the uh, two-day fight is of the headquarters of the East India Company in Calcutta, where Madden would have spent uh, some of his time. Um, he was a, a brilliant amateur botanist. So you can see here's part of our records at Basnevin. It's the 25th of April, 1850. So 174 years ago, and he's sending, they call them papers, not packs back then, but 20 packs of, of seed from, uh, from the Himalaya, from Nepal. And these were regular consignments coming in every couple of weeks. Um, and he sent his seed to Glasnevin, to Belfast Botanic Gardens, to Kew, and to Fennessy's Nursery in County Waterford in South East Ireland. He became a brilliant amateur botanist and was greatly admired by Joseph Hooker, so much so that Joseph Hooker named one of his discoveries after Edward Madden, Rhododendron Maddenai, which of course is one of the most beautiful of all of the scented rhododendrons. Another Irishman was Pakenham Edgeworth. Pakenham Edgeworth came from Edgeworthstown in County Longford in the, in the Irish Midlands. He was one of 22 children in that family by four different mothers. His eldest sister was the famous Irish novelist, Maria Edgeworth, who was the Jane Austen of her day. But Pakenham spent uh, about 20 years of his life as a colonial administrator uh, in British India. Um, he was a brilliant amateur botanist. He, he was used by Joseph Hooker. In Joseph Hooker's multi-volume, Flora of British India, he wrote up the Caryophyll Lacey. Uh, and Joseph uh, Hooker named Rhododendron Edgewortii in his honour. Lovely plant. Uh, many of you may grow it in your garden, but if you've seen it in the wild, you'll have seen it 150 feet up in the boughs of Suga de Mosa. Of course, it's an epiphytic species um, in the wild. Beautifully scented flowers that have been used to breed all sorts of ten tender hybrids. And then there's Joseph Hooker. So you can see on the top of the slide uh, is the 22nd of April 1850. So this is the single most important consignment of rhododendron uh, seeds ever to have been sent to Glasnevin, sent by Joseph Hooker. So this is the famous image that depicts Hooker in the Himalayan mountains. He's dreamt as a, 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 a as a local um, in, in local Himalayan uh, garb. Uh, and he's been presented with the flowers of the day, the gatherings of the day by his Lepcha collectors. And we know that because they're wearing their traditional Lepcha uh, costume, these striped um, uh, linen uh, costumes. This is his Gurkha, his Nepalese Gurkha soldier there to protect him. And of course, it's Rhododendron Arboreum. So Joseph Hooker um, had previously traveled in the Antarctic in the 1830s. By the 1840s, he was looking for a tropical flora to, to explore. He had two choices. He could go to the Andes in South America or he could go to the, the Himalaya. And he chose the latter because, of course, Hugh Faulkner, who was then the superintendent of the Calcutta Botanic Gardens, said to him that he would assist him in all of his travels. And in return, if you helped Joseph Hooker in any way, he named the most beautiful plants after you. So this is Rhododendron falconeri named for Hugh Faulkner. Uh, it appeared in the Rhododendrons of the Sikkim Himalaya, one of his most famous works produced, even when he was still traveling in the Himalaya. It was published between 1849 and 1851. I always questioned the fact that the, the truss, the flower truss appears as white, because of course in cultivation, it's primrose yellow. But actually when I traveled on the very mountain that Hooker found founded on, Tonglu, which straddles the Sikkim and Nepal Himalaya, we actually came across it in, in uh, April uh, 2015, white flowered trees on the mountain. It's quite rare. I haven't seen it in cultivation, but interesting to see it uh, having always questioned Hooker's plate. 
So this is the countryside that Joseph Hooker travelled through. This is in the northern uh, limits of Sikkim as you approach the Tibetan frontier. So this is on the tree line, Abies Densa, the West Himalayan um, uh, fir, uh, with Muricaria rosea in the foreground, another of Hooker's discoveries, um, and rhododendron fulgens climbing up the mountainside. Um, it is one of the great biodiversity hotspots of the of the world. Um, physically, the uh, the uh, political boundary is only the size of Ireland's county Cork, but of course, because of the land surface, some of the tallest mountains in the world greatly exaggerate the surface area. This is Mount Pandem, uh, and it's photographed from our trek as we approach Katinjunga, the third tallest mountain uh, on the planet. So it was. As I mentioned, it was under David Moore's directorship and stewardship of Glasnevin that those seed packs were raised at Glasnevin. You can see in the background some of these images, they're sketches made by Joseph Hooker, in this case of rhododendron, rhododendron arboreum, I beg your pardon, in the Zimu Valley in, in North uh, Sikkim. So, these seedlings were raised at Glasnevin, but of course the, the, the dilemma was is that they could not be grown out, out of doors because of course they, the pH was far too high. So they were first grown in pots in the curvilinear range of glass, ha glass houses at Glasnevin, put on display when they were in bloom. By 1862, they had just got far too big. They were unwieldy. They, they had just got absolutely huge uh, in, in the glass house. At this time, uh, David Moore was advising the Acton family at Kilmacurra. So while Glasnevin was in the north side suburbs of, of Dublin, Kilmacurra was this big old country estate 40 miles south in County Wicklow. Uh, the estate covered 5,500 acres of some of the best land in Ireland. Uh, deep brown earth, high rainfall, beautifully acidic soil. So it was absolutely perfect for rhododendrons. At this time, the gardens uh, were... Um, gradually being changed by Thomas and his sister Janet. So this is Janet in the Dora case in 1894. They were amongst the greatest plants people in Ireland during the Victorian era. At, at that time, they were sweeping away a formal Dutch park and they were creating a new wild garden uh, to accommodate all of the many new exotics that were coming in. And they gardened at an important time when we had just left in Europe, we had just departed from the Little Ice Age, our climate was warming. But not just that, we were entering what we now recognise as the golden era of plant exploration. And through last Nevin, there was this enormous flood of new, of new plants. And thus began the relationship between David Moore and the Actons at Kilmacurra and the flow of plants from Glass Nevin. In 1862, when these rhododendrons were planted at uh, Kilmacurra, we'd like to remind visitors that sister seedlings of Joseph Hooker's rhododendrons were being grown by people like Charles Darwin and Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale grew one of the largest collections of rhododendron species in Europe. But when she received the collections of Joseph Hooker from Kew, uh, it actually doubled the collection, her collection uh, in size. It became one of the mega collections. David Moore uh, was very keen on plant hybridization. Uh, he bred lots of plants, not just orchids and, and insectivorous plants, but rhododendrons were a passion. And he was one of the earliest people in Ireland to create rhododendron hybrids. So from Joseph Hooker's seedlings, he crossed rhododendron campanulatum with rhododendron arboreum, a white flowered form. Um, the, the clutch of seedlings were sent down to Kilmacurra and grown on. Um, bred in 1860, uh, and began to flower about 10 years later. In 1880, uh, the plant was formally named by uh, Sir Frederick Moore uh, for Thomas Acton. So Th Frederick Moore had taken over from his father as garden advisor and director, garden advisor to Kilmacurra and director at Glass Nevin. Um, and whilst the rhododendron was named by Sir Frederick Moore, uh, in 1880. It actually wasn't registered with the Royal Horticultural Society until six years ago. Um, so it takes us a while to catch up in Ireland, but we do eventually get there. So that rhododendron, Thomas Acton, the original plant still grows with us. It's a lovely plant. So Joseph Hooker began the flow of these of these uh, introductions from 
um, the Himalaya. Again, this is from our records at Glasnevin. It's 1857, and you can see on April 7th from Dr. Hooker. In this case, this is uh, coming in from William Hooker. And it's collections in the Eastern Himalaya from Thomas Thompson. So Thomas Thompson was a, a childhood friend of Joseph Hooker. They had gone to... Uh, to high school together, they had been to university together, they even plant hunted together um, in uh, 1850. And while Hooker stayed in the Himalaya, and of course, one of the plants that Joseph Hooker named for him was Rhododendron Thompsoni. This is a particularly good form photographed at Edinburgh Botanic Gardens with these wonderful red calices. If you're buying Rhododendron Thompsoni, try to buy it when it's in bloom. Um, because uh, these are the forms you want. You want with that red calice, and we have it luckily uh, here in the gardens at Kilmacara. By the late 19th century, uh, Kilmacara had become internationally famous for its collection. In fact, it had the largest collection of rhododendron uh, species uh, from the Himalaya in Europe at the time. Gardens were completely completely altered by Janet and Thomas with the guidance of, da of David Moore and later Sir Frederick Moore. So this is a view looking down one of the most iconic walks at Kilmacara. It's the, the Great Broad Walk. Broad walks became incredibly fashionable in the 19th century when Decimus Burton laid out the Broad Walk at Kew. And the walk at Kilmacara is exactly 20 feet wide and is, it was designed to be wide enough that two Victorian ladies with their wide flowing crinoline and dresses could promenade back and forth without bumping into one another. It was planted initially with um, rhododendron uh, alta clarense and Irish ewes. And you can see images here. This is it in about 1880 and again in 1894. And it's a pity that Janet and Thomas couldn't come back to see the, the walk as it is in the 21st century. But these are the scenes that you see. And this is what it will look like next week. As Harry mentioned, Storm Kathleen swept a lot of the petals away. But we expect that by the weekend, uh, it will look exactly like that. So as I mentioned, it's alternating Irish hues with the High Clear Rhododendron, Rhododendron Alta Clarense, which was bred at High Clear in 1828 with rhododendron Cunningham's white. And the reason Cunningham's white appear, appears on the walk is because before David Moore came to Ireland, he worked in um, Cunningham's nursery in, in Edinburgh. Okay, so by the late, uh, the latter part of the 19th century, suddenly China opens its bamboo uh, curtain. Because of uh, an unequal treaty that late, related back to the Opium War, China was forced to cede its ports open to to commercial uh, to commerce for, by European powers, and also to allow uh, missionaries uh, in in both Protestant and Roman Catholic missionaries into China. But this is a view of um, one of the most important uh, gardens in Western China. It's Black Dragon Pool Park in Lijiang, uh, with Jade Dragon Snow Mountain rising up above it. Typical Ming Dynasty uh, garden, a uh, beautiful place that would have been very familiar to people like Pierre Delave de and to George Forrest. Sir Frederick Moore succeeded his father as director of Glasnevin in 1879, and he was only 22 years old at the time. It could be seen as nepotism, but actually it was a, a policy that absolutely worked within the three royal botanic gardens. Uh, Sir Frederick Moore was the first person ever to be knighted for services to horticulture. And in, the his in history, only three people have ever been knighted for services to horticulture. Sir Frederick Moore being first, followed by Sir, Sir um, Harry Beach uh, and then by uh, Sir Harold Hillier. Um, so he was the greatest plantsman in Ireland in the 20th century, and he raised Glasnevin up, as I mentioned, to international problems, so much so that the, it was said in 1922 that the only garden that could surpass it was Kew, the only botanic garden that could equal it was, was Edinburgh. His wife was Phyllis, uh, Phyllis Lady Moore, and between David Moore, Sir Frederick Moore, and his wife, uh, Phyllis Lady Moore, there is a connection between the Moors of Glasnevin and Kilnakar for fully 110 years. It's incredible service. Uh, and that was the reason why we were always very keen to rescue um, 
Kilmacar from dereliction uh, in the in the late 20th century when the gardens were abandoned. So we purchased Kilmacar in 1996, made a second purchase about four years ago. And currently it's one of the largest garden and house restorations in Europe. Uh, it's, it's a huge project, but a wonderful project to be to partake in. So Frederick Moore, while Kilmacar was his favourite project outside of Glasnevin, he also uh, advised in some of the most significant uh, rhododendron gardens in Ireland, including Roe Allen, which is in, nowadays, of course, is in Northern Ireland. What's interesting to see is that even after the partition of Ireland in 1922, Glasnevin continued to send uh, huge amounts of rhododendrons up north to Roe Allen. And uh, the original stock for that garden, 80% of it came from Glasnevin. Hedford, so this is Hedford, house in County Mead. This is the Marquis of Hedford, who was one of Ireland's greatest plants people. We're going to come to him later. He was a great friend of George Forrest, and he's commemorated in Rhododendron Tagianum Hedfordianum group. The Walpoles at Mount Usher, they were Dublin linen merchants, they created a magical garden just up the road from us, and that's Mount Usher that you see in the background, one of the most important Robinsonian gardens in Europe. And Ardnamona on Loch Besk in County Donegal, it's a private garden. It's like a little piece of the Himalaya in Donegal. Uh, it was created by the Wallaces, uh, and uh, they were cousins, of course, of the Actons at Kilmacurra. So this is part of our history. It's from, uh, we have a, an enormous archive. We're very fortunate to have the Acton family archive um, at Glasnevin. And you can see it's much changed times. Queen Victoria is, is on the throne. It's the Royal Botanic Gardens, Glasnevin, in County Dublin. And you can see it's new Chinese rhododendrons. So this is an exciting time for Kilmacara. We've moved from growing almost exclusively European, North American and Himalayan rhododendrons. And suddenly uh, there's this plethora of plants coming in. That particular photograph was taken by George Forrest on the, uh, on the Jay Dragon Snow Mountain, which I mentioned earlier. And that's uh, Rhododendron rex subspecies Victolactium in its native setting. It was an Irish man who opened the great wealth of China and made it known to Western nations. So Augustine Henry, who was the son of an Irish famine immigrant, uh, he grew up in County Derry in, in, in the northwest of Ireland. Um, he moved out to uh, China to work for Customs Service in 1881. He had absolutely no interest in botany and it was his work as a customs official for the customs service in China that gave him an interest in botany. He was based here at Yichang in Hubei province in central China and he was later followed by E.H. Wilson and this is E.H. Wilson's photograph of Yichang in 1906. When Augustine Henry uh, began collecting in 1885 it had been said by Charles Maurice, the Vichy and plant hunter, that there was absolutely nothing new to be discovered in China, that everything interesting had been collected by Robert Fortune. And to the embarrassment of the Vichy nursery, he, he absolutely was dismissed by the work carried out by Augustine Henry over the next 15 years. Between 1885 and 1900, Augustine Henry sent 158,000 herbarium specimens back to Kew. That comprised 6,000 uh, species, of which 1,700 were new to science. That included absolute gems like Rhododendron augustinii, one of the most beautiful rhododendrons you can grow in your garden with wonderful blue tones. This is at the Rhododendron Species Botanical Gardens in, in Seattle. That species is absolutely lime tolerant, by the way. That's Augustine Henry's own photograph of rhododendrons south of the Red River in, in uh, Yunnan province. And then there were the French missionaries. At one point, there were two and a half thousand French missionaries based in China. Many of them made great uh, naturalists. You've just got to think of people like Pierre Armand David. But Pierre Delvey has a direct connection with Kilmacara in that we grow and still grow several of his collections. So Pierre Delvey was based here. This is Dali in northwest Yunnan. These are the three pagodas at Dali, the oldest standing structures in, in southwest China. 10th century, 14th century, Erhai Lake in the background, which was visited by Marco Polo. But from a botanical point of view, it's the Kangshan, this mountain range in the background, climbed by Pierre Jean-Marie Delavay in 1884. 
he sent his seed collections not to the botanic gardens in, in Paris. He knew very quickly not to send them there. It wasn't a particularly good place for raising rhododendron seeds. He sent his collections to the Wilmerin nursery outside of Paris. They sent his rhododendron collections to Kew, and such was the, the fame of the gardens at Kilmacurra that his seedlings were dispatched directly from Kew to Thomas and Janet Acton. The effect of that was that many of them blossomed for the very first time outside of China in gardens at Kilmacurra, and that included rhododendron arboreum subspecies Delavei. This is the plate of the Kilmacurra plant from Curtis's Botanical Magazine, uh, but the the original plant is in full bloom at the moment, uh, so there is great longevity in rhododendron species. E. H. Wilson. E. H. Wilson, of course, was so successful, Gloucestershire man, that he became known. Uh, so good at his work that he became known as Chinese Wilson. Uh, he met Augustine Henry in South Yunnan province. Um, his quest was to collect the handkerchief tree for the beach nursery. His first two expeditions were for the beach nursery, his latter two for the Orange Arboretum. But this is Rhododendron David Sonianum, his original specimen at Kilmacurra. It's interesting to note that in the original Latin diagnosis for this species, it states that it's a shrub of two to three meters tall, but you can see that it's much, much taller in cultivation. Growing beside it is Joseph Hooker's original specimen of Rhododendron grande, planted there in 1862. And in the background, of course, Crinodendron hookeri in him, the British and Irish champion, um, the original collection by William Lobb from Chile. So it is a bit of a, a plant hunter's uh, um, sort of sacred area, this part of the garden. George Forrest, uh, an ill-tempered short Scotsman uh, who made a brilliant plant hunter. Uh, you can see him here standing in a moon gate in, um, in Dali. And this is his garret, as he called it, in, uh, in Lijiang, in Little Snow Mountain. Um, his collections uh, above. And then you can see here his campsite with Jade Dragon Snow Mountain rising up behind it. I'm leading a group up this mountain in late June this year. Uh, it's one of the, the meccas for even contemporary plant hunters. And his herbarium specimens now housed at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh. You can see them drying in the sun just beneath the mountainside. He used up to 50 um, Chinese uh, uh, plant collectors that he trained and spread them out right across a huge area to collect um, for, for him. Um, this syndicate um, and sort of for these plant hunters, they were brought together and organized by three people. That, of course, the greatest of these was Donald Rothschild from Exbury, J.C. Williams from um, from Exbury uh, near Southampton, and of course, uh, Reginald Corey, who had a great garden in, in Wales. Um, we have a lot to thank Red Lionel de Rothschild for here in Ireland because he paid for the seed shares of the three Royal Botanic Gardens, including Glasnevin. And what that meant was that they further distributed the collections. And that's why we have a lot of the collections of the great plant hunters still in the gardens uh, at Kilmacora. The seed shares were paid for to Rothschild Banking. So this is from uh, the library at Glasnevin, and you can see. These are the, uh, the field notes of George Forrest, uh, the, the Glasnevin um, copies signed by George Forrest himself. Uh, interesting to see, actually, that his 24116 Rhododendron Greer Sonianum, it had been previously introduced. It became one of the major stud species for rhododendron breeding. And you can see Forrest notes, there's no comment needed about this, no further comments, because it's already known it's such a beautiful plant and it's such a great plant for, for use for use for, for breeding purposes. So you can see this is George Forrest image of the same pagodas that I showed you earlier before restoration with the Kangshan uh, in the background. Uh, what's great is when you leaf through these field notes at Glass Nevin, you can actually see all these little annotations and you can see that this partic particular collection, 1897, is in the Chinese border at Glass Nevin. And it gives you an indication of what's flooding the uh, gardens at Glass Nevin and at Kilmacurra and Hedford and many other Irish places uh, at this time. It really was a golden era of plant exploration. Forrest 
Kingdom Ward, they all visited Ireland. Uh, it was easy to get across to, of course, from from um, from from uh, the United Kingdom. So this is a very famous photograph, and it's of George Forrest in Ireland, standing in the garden of Marquis of Hedford in Kells in County Mead in the Irish Midlands, not far from Dublin. He's here with his head gardener. This is Hugh Armitage Moore, who created a famous gardens, now belongs to the National Trust, at Row Allen in County Down, standing with Lady Moore, no relation, but wife of Sir Frederick Moore, and Lord Hedford himself. So Lord Hedford was really lucky in that the garden advisors at Hedford were Sir Frederick Moore, and not just that, but W.J. Bean, the curator of the Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew. And it became one of the very best stocked gardens in Europe, with the, with the best stocked pinetum uh, in, in Europe at the time. Lord Hedford was absolutely bereft when he heard the news that George Forrest had, had died in Yadam. So Forrest was out uh, shooting on the hills above Tengue, and he dropped dead very suddenly from a heart attack. Uh, he was carried back down the mountains by his native uh, Chinese collectors. Um, a wreath of, of uh, rhododendrons was placed on his grave. You can see this was sent to his wife, Clementina, uh, at the time. And to commemorate George Forrest, he created an entirely new garden dedicated to George Forrest and that still exists at Hedford to this day. Back to uh, Kilmacurra. Um, so by the um, late uh, uh, sort of 20th century, by the late 19th century, uh, Kilmacurra was changing hands. So Thomas and, and Janet had died by 1908 and their nephew, uh, Charles Ansley Ball Acton came back to manage the estate. Uh, he was based at the time of Jonathan Thomas's death as a soldier in Burma. So between 1908 and 1915, he continued to develop gardens with the help of Sir Frederick Moore. He became a, a friend of J.C. Williams. So this is J.C. Williams' seat, of course, at Kerahay's Castle near St. Austell in Cornwall, one of the greatest woodland gardens in the world, uh, a place of pilgrimage. Um, I was really lucky that last year to actually uh, sit inside there beneath uh, the portrait of J.C. Williams himself, talking to his grandson, Charles Williams, who, who's continued to develop the garden. But J.C. Williams uh, began swapping plants with Captain Acton and that's how we acquired many of the collections of George Forrest. Joseph Rock was one of the very last plant hunters in China. In fact, he was the last. He was expelled by the new communist forces in the late 1940s, uh, but his collections came to Trude Last Evan, again through the sponsorship of Ronald de Rothschild, um, and they reached Irish gardens having been raised uh, at Last Evan. Uh, in, by uh, by Sir Frederick Moore and his successor, John Bazant. Captain Frank Kingdon Ward is one of my great heroes. Um, he's the longest serving plant hunter in the field. Um, he was the son of a Cambridge professor um, and his first wife was Ferinda Norman Thompson. She was Irish, so she grew up in Delgany, which is just up the road from Kilmacurra. So she probably knew this garden and probably knew the Actons. And he named for her um, Mechanopsis florindae, but better known Primula florindae, the, the giant cowslip uh, from Tibet. So Kingdon Ward's collections, again, they filtered through Glasnevin. Firstly, in his early expeditions in 1911 and 1913 for A.K. Bully of Bee Seeds, and then later through his larger sponsors, um, the, the Rothschilds, the, um, the Williamses, uh, and, and so on. This is above the Atakang Glacier in Tibet. He's out using his Tibetan uh, collectors uh, with their hunting dogs um, over a forest of Abiyes Densa. His most famous collection, of course, was in 1927 when he went to Nagaland and he collected with an Irish botanist, Norman Loftus Burr, who was working for the Indian Forest Service. Norman Loftus Burr was originally from um, from County Waterford, later went on to become the assistant director of Kew. Uh, but in uh, the 20s, he brought Kingdom Ward to Saramati and it was from both Japhu and Saramati that he that Kingdom Ward introduced Rhododendron Macabianum to cultivation. Some of you might grow as well Rhododendron Saracinum, so this of course is his cherry brandy form, um, one of his most significant uh, discoveries and introductions uh, from a similar region. And it wasn't just men out collecting 
at the time. Uh, lots of women and lots of Irish women were involved in botanizing uh, and involved partly through uh, sort of colonial service. So Lady Charlotte Wheeler Cuff was married to Sir Otway Fortescue Wheeler Cuff. He was a baronet from uh, County Kilkenny from Lyrash House, now a well-known hotel. Um, so he worked for the Burmese Board of Works. And when he wasn't working on these enormous civil engineering projects, um, he was uh, traveling uh, to various different places, uh, the Chin Hills and, and modern day Kachin State. So while he was carrying out his work, Charlotte traveled with him and she went botanizing, bringing her easel and bringing her her very impress with her. This is one of her sketchbooks and we have her entire archive at Glasnevin. So this is the approach to Chin Hills and Mount Victoria, one of the tallest mountains near the Bang Bangladesh border. Um, when I traveled with a group out here a couple of years ago, um, we I'd read all of her diaries and looked at all of her paintings and she left lovely uh, accounts of climbing this mountain. And she said that when you look down one side, you could see the searchlights of steamers on the Irrawaddy and you could see on the other side, the sun setting over the Bay of Bengal. So she began collecting and she began sending her collections back to Das Levin. So this is Lady Cuff photographed in Burma. She later went on to um, establish a botanic gardens at Miemo at the hill station for uh, Mandalay, a really famous botanic gardens. Again, there's a letter in our archives at Glasnevin. She's writing to Sir Frederick Moore and she's saying, I couldn't sleep last night. They've just given me 150 acres of tiger infested jungle on which to create a botanic gardens. And we should have all lived in this period because the opportunities of botanizing and gardening at the time were, were immense. So from Mount Victoria, she sent back Wardian cases full of plants and from those, three new species of Rhododendron were described. Rhododendron burmanicum, Rhododendron cuffianum, and Rhododendron arboreum albotomentosum. So the only place in the world where that particular variety grows is on top of Mount Victoria, on the summit of the mountain. So it first grew uh, outside of Burma at Glasnevin in Dublin. Um, this is Rhododendron cuffianum, and it's the plate that appeared in Curtis's Botanical Magazine. The vignette in the background is of the plant photographed at Glasnevin in 1910, described by Harry Tagg. But I was really fortunate in that when I was traveling in Burma, I met Rhododendron cuffianum. It's incredibly rare uh, to see in the wild. It, the only person I know who grows it in cultivation is Steve, Steve Hootman in the Rhododendron Species Botanical Gardens uh, in Seattle. But on the 18th of November, uh, 2016, it was my birthday. Uh, I woke up uh, to hear somebody actually vomiting underneath where we were staying. And one of my colleagues actually, uh, it turned out, uh, was uh, had kidney stones. So we had to get this person back down the mountain as fast as we possibly could to a hospital. It was a two day uphill trek through tropical jungles. And we did it, had to do it over a couple of hours. So we literally ran through the forest on the day. I stopped to photograph just three plants along the way. We were racing our way through Dipterocarp Forest and the trees were 200 feet overhead. On the ground, you couldn't see the plants because, of course, they were epiphytic, 150 feet up through the trees, were the fallen blossoms of Rhodin Cuffianum. So it was a remarkable sight. I didn't have long to, um, to enjoy it because, of course, we had a med medical emergency on our hands on the day. Lucky enough, the guy that, that, that was suffering um, recovered and he's absolutely fine today. But it was great to see Rhododendron Cuffianum in its wild native habitat. So this is Lady Cuff's um, depiction of Rhododendron arboreum albotomentosum with the Mount Victoria in the background. And this is on the summit of the mountain. And this is it flowering in a garden uh, in County Waterford. If you can get it, it's fantastic. The largest specimen I know grows at Doreen, which of course was once the seat of the Marquis of Lansdowne in Ireland. Uh, it's a good 30 feet tall, but it's one of the heaviest flowered forms you can get of, of Rhododendron arboreum albotomentosum. So the Moors gave a lot to the culture of Rhododendrons in Ireland. It is remarkable that a garden over a uh, soil that with a soil type that it has a pH of 7.9 has given so much and and, and develop so many collections uh, outside, uh, you know, in, in Irish gardens. Sir Frederick Moore 
of course, is our greatest ever director. Um, and he was, just to sort of go back to Rhododendrons, he was the first Irish person ever to have been awarded the Loder Rhododendron Cup uh, for services to Rhododendrons. And not just that, Lionel de Rothschild, who was a personal friend, uh, he bred many, many rhododendrons. So he raised a batch of seedlings. He crossed rhododendron uh, for, for tunii subspecies uh, discolor with rhododendron St. Kevron, raised a batch of seedlings, named one of them for Colin de Rothschild and named a sister seedling for Sir Frederick Moore. So that rhododendron has been extinct in Ireland uh, for in Irish gardens for well over 30 years now. Really pleased to say that last week, John Anderson, uh, who's keeper of the uh, Savile Gardens at Windsor Great Park, uh, delivered us a plant that had been propagated from there. So I'm going to finish with this image of rhododendron forest, and this is cloud forest on uh, Mount Saramati in Nagaland in northeast India. It's one of the wettest places on the planet, so you can see the stems are absolutely draped with moss and with filmy ferns. And you'll notice actually all the rhododendrons are of the, a similar age. So in 1950, uh, the Himalaya was struck by what we know today as the Great Assam earthquake. Entire swathes of mountains were made bare to landslides. So when you walk to many parts of the Himalaya today, you come across entire forests where the trees are just 70 years old. And that's because suddenly it gave the opportunity for rhododendrons to move in and form entire cloud forests. So that's rhododendron arboreum. Uh, subspecies Cinnamomium in its in its uh, native habitat. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, that's it from me. Uh, I hope that gives you a taste of the history of rhododendrons uh, in Ireland. Should mention, of course, Mary has mentioned, of course, that it's Rhododendron Week, and Kilmacora, of course, is the oldest rhododendron garden in Ireland. Our oldest specimen is well over two hundred years old. Uh, again, it's Rhododendron arboreum. Um, Haunted before 1820, and it's the tallest rhododendron in, in Britain and Ireland. So we have a, a long history of growing rhododendrons, but it was the gardens at the National Botanic Gardens, Glasnevin in Dublin, our sister garden, that really put Kilmacurra on the map and made it become the, me the mega rhododendron garden that it was and which we are restoring today. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. Wow, we um thank you so much, Seamus. That was absolutely amazing. So much information in there. And that last picture is making me want to go to the Himalayas like right now. <laughs> That's such a lovely picture. Could everyone just uh give give Seamus a round of applause? I've uh, asked you to unmute. If you could unmute or just give Seamus a, a show of appreciation. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. My pleasure. What's that for? Thank you. So, Mark, I think we're going for, and um, Mary, we're going for uh, a Q&A now, is that right? Yeah, I think you can stop, stop sharing I your stop screen. Sharing. Sharing. That's great. Ah, there you are. Great. Yeah. And thanks so much, Seamus. That was absolutely wonderful. And just in the gardens in Kilmacurra today, the rhododendron, the Davidsonianum, is just about to burst. And that is, if ever there was an encouragement to visit, yeah. that is it. Um, it's a great time. Great time. Yeah. And actually, Mark, I'm sure for your garden too, for Minturn is approaching its very best at the moment, I'm sure as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the weather has been very kind for the blooms as well, and it's it's always coming out now, and it's a very inspiring time, isn't it? Yeah, just to, we're, we are getting questions in, and in Kilmacurra, we did get questions in by email for this evening for those who weren't to attend, but just, um, there's one here from Frank and Kate. Is there a general explanation or rule of thumb for the differing colorings or reverse of rhododendron leaves, I you know the silver, the green, the brown. For yeah, both, for both of you, you know the indumentum would it be higher altitude, or would be there would be something kind of that would be an indicator. Okay, with regard to the plant, does it tell you nearly where it's from? Yeah, 
Um, I will give one example. Mark, I'm sure you've got an example as well. So um, if you choose uh, one particular species, Rhododendron arboreum. So Rhododendron arboreum is widespread across the Himalaya. So if you look at what we call Rhododendron arboreum, bar arboreum, which is the, the, the kind of red flowered, it's beautiful deep red flowers. It can be tender in colder parts of, of Britain and Ireland. Um, that particular uh, red flowered form grows at, at hill, around hill station level at about sort of seven to 9,000 feet altitude, which is quite low. It's in the foothills of the Himalaya. And if you turn the leaf, it's a plastered silver ingementum. Um, and that's because it grows at relatively low altitudes. But then if you rise up higher, when you get sort of above the, I suppose about sort of 10,000 up to about 13,000 feet altitude, you get what's called Rhododendron arboreum subspecies cinnamomium. That's got what's called bistrate ingementum. And it's, it's sort of a double layer of this sort of fluffy, spongy, cinnamon colored ingementum. And essentially what that is, is a duvet and it protects the plant from extremes of cold temperatures. You know, it does get very, very cold. I mean, I've been trapped by snow in the Himalaya at times. It is it is very, very cold. So when you see that particular form, and it's, of course, one of the parents of that lovely rhododendron, Sir Charles Lemon, that if you look at the underside of the leaf, um, it's, it's this lovely felt suede brown that indicates that it comes from a much higher altitude. And Mark, I'm sure you've got examples, you know, of the different ingementum types as well. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 plenty isn't there and a large leaf um sort of macabia in them so of course they got that sort of very um uh, full of instrumental on the underside um but yeah ab absolutely depicts um the, the altitude um and and how much it, it it protects that um the leaves as you get higher and higher and it gets colder and colder mm. and actually at an extreme level with ingementum, Rhododendron protistum, which is a really, really lovely big leaf species, it doesn't fully develop its ingementum until it's 50 years old. Uh, so you need to be you need to be young to plant your Rhododendron protistum and see it get into its adult phase. That's brilliant. And just, you know, I suppose just following on from that topic, something we did get in today was about, you know, how is, is climate change affecting rhododendron you know you're talking about different altitudes but just present day with the weather conditions i'm sure for you both how do you feel it's affecting the the genus yeah mark i might let you talk about what's happening in the south of england and you know the policies of the rhs and uh predictions for the future i know uh, and then i can say what's happening certainly here mm -hmm. in, in ireland yeah, sure. So, I mean, in in the southeast, uh, in, in particular, it's it's really affecting, um, uh, you know, mainly species rhododendron. They're a, a lot, lot more harder to to keep uh, keep alive, really. But um, especially that it's just drying up um, in in the southeast, and we're seeing that more and more. Um, of course, you know, saying that right now, we've got so much rain at the moment, it seems it seems bonkers. But yeah, but as soon as the summer comes and, and we get dry periods. Those prolonged dry periods are really affecting uh, the rhododendrons, uh, especially in the southeast. Um, over in in Minton, we, we're further west, and we don't feel it quite so much at the moment. But yeah, the um, the RHS are making efforts to propagate, um, at, like at Wisley, propagate their uh, rhododendrons, and then and then to move them up uh, up north, where it's, it's going to be cooler for them um, in in the summer periods. Um, so there's something really to bear in mind uh, and and something to look for. Um, so how yeah. is Ireland? That's well, in funny. Ireland, actually, it's funny. If you look at sort of uh, our two gardens, uh, the National Botanic Gardens, Glasnevin and, and Cumberpera, um, Glasnevin's progressively getting drier. We're just 40 miles down the road and we're just getting wetter and wetter and wetter. So we've just had to put in incredible amounts of drainage into the garden. It's a costly procedure, but it stems off uh, the diseases of rhododendrons like Phytophthora. So that's the one of the, you know, it sounds great that we're getting wetter. It's it's better than getting drier, but that brings all sorts of challenges. And Phytophthora is the big one. Um, so, yeah, it, it is expected that on these islands in Britain and Ireland, that there will be a sort of a westward shift uh, towards growing uh, rhododendrons that, Probably in 
50 years, it'll be very, very difficult to grow rhododendrons in in the drier places, the south southeast of England. Uh, Glasnevin's already looking at changing the the sort of the the collections, the arboretum collections, going for uh, for trees that can take a hotter, drier climate. But we're certainly looking at dealing with uh, a wetter climate. And we've certainly got a good taste of that uh, this spring. We've had three and a half times our normal rainfall for this time of year. And uh, globally, we've just had the warmest March on record. So it is amazing that in our lifetimes, we can see all this change. And just, just of interest, Seamus, um, Mark, what we are seeing is, you know, the prevailing wind in Ireland is coming from the southwesterly. And Seamus, you've done extensive planting. Uh, yeah, the, the prevailing wind being southwesterly, but that wind change is turning to be more easterly, which is causing much more damage. And you've done a huge amount of planting, of hedgerow planting to protect the garden, Seamus. Yeah, so, yeah. Do you, do you think that will be... That would be a big, big factor. I mean, um, traditionally, uh, the damaging winds were coming in from the southwest, but actually we're finding mm -hmm. that uh, a huge amount of the damage is now coming from the east or from or from winds swirling, where you get a storm and it's coming from every direction. So we've planted eight kilometres of new shelter belts around the estate uh, of native hedge hedgerows. Um, all material that's been gathered sort of, you know, from a native Irish source as well. So that will sort of... Uh, protect the gardens for the next hopefully 150 years so it's planning for the future mark i'm sure you're doing the same absolutely yeah 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 i mean it's, it's something that we all have to do it's just uh and e even in our smaller gardens sometimes we just have to uh we have to get our plants in because they they, they will continue um and just think think in the future um you know especially all these big, the big gardens as well we have to make sure that they're going to survive you know 200 years uh, 300 Ooh. years and uh that that's quite quite a thought sometimes um but it's quite exciting um to be able to do that as well it's it's, it's lovely lovely to be able to do do these things for the future yeah just one interesting question in here and i suppose we could get two questions out of it <laughs> excuse me what varieties of rhododendron have ponticum in them and so may be slightly invasive are great to grow in a big woodland type area. Okay, um, Mark, I'm sure you've got something to say about this as well. Um, rhododendron ponticum, actually a lot of hardy hybrids have ponticum uh, in them. So rhododendron alta clarense, uh, when um, the species were first introduced, it was found they were slightly tricky to grow. Some of them were slightly tender. So a lot of the early hybridizers, particularly the waters uh, back across, they used rhododendron ponticum and it's related North American uh, cousin rhododendron catabiense uh, to bring hardiness and a more compact habit in. So you'll find that, I mean, we could list, we could list hundreds of, of hybrids that contain rhododendron ponticum uh, in, in, their, um, in their parentage. Um, so just a word, actually, if I can, on rhododendron ponticum, because actually mm -hmm. it's really unfair to blame the species for the problems that we've encountered in places like uh, the Lakelands uh, district in, we'll say, in, in England, uh, in the better parts of Ireland, uh, in places like Killarney National Park, um, Connemara and, and so on. Uh, rhododendron ponticum, actually, it, it was native to Britain and Ireland before the last sort of great glacial era. Um, and it was a perfectly well-behaved plant. Um, I've been at meetings, RHS, RCMG meetings, where we've had somebody from the National Trust actually explain to us, actually, part of the Duchy of Cornwall micropropagation, where they have been um, uh, used by the government of Spain to propagate rhododendron ponticum growing on the Iberian Peninsula because of climate change, it's no longer setting seed there. It's endangered. So the plant that we blame for its invasiveness is, is a man-made hybrid between rhododendron ponticum and a North American species, rhododendron catabiense. So rhododendron species are actually well-behaved plants. Uh, there's about a thousand species. We've grown lots of them over the course of 200 years here in the gardens at Kilmacurra. All the species have been well-behaved. It's that man-made hybrid, that's the thug. Mm. 
um, has been named the rhododendron superconstum, that's related. Um, but rhododendron species on the whole are well behaved. Yeah, and just there was one other question just following on with that, Seamus, about how many species are there? How many types of rhododendron? Yeah, well, is there is that? It's, uh, you know, at the moment, there's about 1,200 species recognised. But of course, um, they new species are being discovered and then other species are being shoved back into synonymy. Um, so they, if you talk to the experts, they reckon there is at, at about 1,000 species, subspecies uh, and varieties there. With regard to... Um... What part of China was rhododendron macabianum collected, Seamus? So it's not native to China. It's native to the eastern Himalaya. Uh, so it was first collected by Kingdom Ward. Actually, it was discovered, I should say, by George Watt in the Naga Hills, in um, uh, which is a... Nagaland is a state of India next to Manipur that borders onto, onto Burma. So it was first found there, Mary, in, in the 1880s by George Watt, and then was introduced to cultivation by Kingdom Ward in 1927 and again in 1925. That's great. That was uh, in from Jack. And um, there was something else here I had for you both. Yeah, but lime tolerant, more lime tolerant for just your both your opinion on lime, more lime tolerant rhododendron. Yeah. Mark, um, sorry, I'm hogging. I'm going to let you. No, that's fine. Yeah. Is there anything <laughs> well I know? I know, there's, I know there's one that I love and I can grow at home. My garden is a little, it's not too, it's not as acidic as maybe I would like it, but I do grow rhododendron augustinii, which I absolutely love. Mm. And so maybe either of you, your opinion? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't have uh, much experience with limes. I've always been with, uh, with you know, ericaceous soils. But there's, you know, I saw that Augustine eye uh, that Seamus put in his talk that was lime tolerant. That's actually new to me. So that's that's a, a nice one to think of. Um, you know, there there are commercially available more lime tolerant uh, rootstocks. Uh, mm. And but there has been research into this, into into what the uh, rhododendrons actually need, uh, and um, you know if you think about the rhododendrons in the wild and they're just hanging on to the cliff sides with barely any soil whatsoever on 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 you know very calcareous rock, uh, you, you start to ponder why, and then you know um, so you know as long as the rhododendron feeds itself, the leaves leaves are left with the rhododendron. It will actually be able to survive in a, in a you know a fair a very small amount of medium, um, but of course in in terms of um, you know going into to your gardens and, and putting in a, a, a rhododendron just into into your garden like that, uh, it, it, it's not the best thing to do. Um, so shame is have you got another, a, a list of lime tolerance? Very, very you, Mark, but actually, what you've said is absolutely the best advice you can give people never rake the leaves out from beneath don't be overly tidy um uh, it's those it's those fallen leaves that uh feed plant uh they give it its magnesium which if you rake away of course they're going, they're going to become chlorotic um and as you said that when you see rhododendrons in yunnan province in particular they're growing in limestone um so there is a leaf litter of rhododendron leaves beneath it. But the only two species that are absolutely lime tolerant, um, as you and Mary have said, rhododendron augustinii. So I grew that at Glass Nevin without any soil preparation in soil with a pH of 7.9. And the other species is rhododendron William C. Anum, which E.H. Wilson discovered in Sichuan province. Lovely plant, beautiful bell-shaped blossoms. Uh, that's equally lime tolerant as well. Um, the trifloras are moderately tolerant, you know, rigid uh, and so on. But then, as you mentioned, Mark, the, the Incaharos are, you know, they're grafted onto lime tolerant rootstock, um, and they are worth experimenting with as well. And just Seamus as well, if um, in Kilmacura, we are, you know, you're now growing a lot of beautiful deciduous azaleas. And you know they're going to look spectacular soon. I have seen them in pots. Is that something you would recommend? Yeah, do you know you can do that with a lot of um of ericaceous plants as long as you use an ericaceous mix and, and mm. well watered. 
People will do exactly the same with hydrangea macrophylla. You know, if you're on limey soil, of course, you want blue hydrangeas. So a big terracotta pot with an ericaceous mix and just give them feed from time to time. And then, of course, the other uh, sort of rhododendrons that people like to grow in pots are the tender scented hybrids. So Lady mm -hmm. Alice Fitzwilliam, Fragrantismum, Countess of Haddington, Harry Tag, you know, they're they're all really well suited to pot culture. Fragrantismum in particular, because mm -hmm. with Fragrantismum, you can just whack it back, you know, every couple of years, cut it hard back to about 60 centimetres, repot it, and it just bounces back again. It's very forgiving. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the, I, it's just in, just after coming into flower in Kilmacurra, and the scent is just knockout. Yeah. Do you, do you grow, Mark, do you grow any of what we might call the smellies? You smellies. Know, the, the gorgeous <laughs> scent. I think it was Charles William who, who referred to them as the smellies. Oh, it's I've, always lovely to have scent. I've, I've, I've only got, um, really, the, the one that I really like, the, the Huse. Uh, in a pot um, collected by uh, by Hooker, and that's that's one that I absolutely love. Um, wow. uh, and just huge, huge blooms on that. Um, and but I'm I'm too scared to build it out in the garden because I don't I don't think it will survive. Okay, but I suppose the message is there's no excuse not to grow. Absolutely not. No, <laughs> yeah. give no. it a try. <laughs> yeah, and well. there is there's another question in for both of you. Have you had much experience with rhododendron rush work? Rush forth the eye. This is in from um sorry, um Jane Nicholson. We have some cuttings that we will be ready to plant out in the next year or so at Brody Castle. It has epiphyte query. So is that something either of you would be familiar with? Rush not. forth the eye. No, Rhododendron Rush forty eye is in the virus subsection, so it's quite tender. Uh, it is very often thick, no, and uh, epiphytic species uh, will require it's very uh, very in... Do you know when it might finish? No, I come in soon, darling. No, I need to get some think... bottle of wine. Wait. No, it's too late now. No, no, it's not. It's not you bad. want it with kidney. No, let's that's, that's, that's not. Sorry, excuse this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're yeah. getting a bit of too much personal information. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we'll be all heading heading in that direction quite yeah. soon. But um, just I suppose everybody always wants to know with two specialists like yourselves. You know, what is do you know? Do you grow rhododendron at home? Is there anything particular that you're very very you know you really really love that you would you know. That would be a favourite, I suppose. Gosh, that's, that's a hard question, isn't it? <laughs> favorites, <it's... laughs> Every season, I'm sure it changes. Do we have a favourite for today? I'm, I'm gonna yeah, today. Okay, we'll today. do today. It's, it's this one I brought, it's, but it's a hybrid. So, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's gorgeous. And you, Seamus, is there anything that you particularly... Uh, yeah, do you know, it's funny, actually. I suppose in the garden, actually, my favourite would be Rhododendron Grande. But actually, travelling in the wild, actually, Mark, you kind of just uh, mentioned rhododendron Dalhousie um, and I brought a group to Sikkim and we were uh, just above the hill station at Darjeeling on a mountain called Senchal and rhododendron Dalhousie was in full bloom. It's either an epiphytic species or an epilytic species. It grows on trees or grows on rocks and uh, for the scale of the actual plant itself, it has the largest flowers of any rhododendron species. And it was the scent of that plant. It was just absolutely glorious. And uh, yeah, Mark, T, you were saying, you know, it's tricky to grow. And I know that historically there's a letter in our archives there where Thomas Acton grew it in the 19th century. And he said every couple of decades, you know, in Britain and Ireland were hit by cold winters. And it would be the plant that you could grow it outside for a couple of decades and then a cold winter would come along and just knock it out, but it's lovely. But there is another one, Rhododendron Dalhousie labdotum, which is striped, and that's just absolutely glorious. But it's the smellies, I suppose. So Lady yeah. Alice Fitzwilliam is lovely. And um, Lady Alice Fitzwilliam, I always thought, was this lovely old genteel English aristocrat. <laughs> I read the biography of the Fitzwilliams and learned what a, what a nasty lady she was. But the rhododendron is wonderful, beautiful. Okay, and a good follow on from that, just something in from um, Monique. Could either of you name one rhododendron that you haven't got that you'd like to grow? 
Mm, yes, absolutely. Um, anything on your, yeah. I mean, it is a bit, it's a long list, but one, one <laughs> plan, uh, would definitely be uh, Road Engine to Parents, which I haven't got yet, but I did see, uh, I was in uh, Ranchal Pradesh last, this time last year, and saw that in the wild. Uh, and it's just the most majestic, large leaf road engine uh, with very, very sort of a real presence to it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, ever since then, I would, I would, I would, yeah, really like it. But was it really... very big, Mark? Was it very yes. big in color, color wise? Yeah. With the, was it in flower? It was literally about to burst into flower. So we didn't quite see it in the flower. So I think if we, if we had stayed another week, which would have been fine by me, that um, I would have seen it in the flower. But, um, it, you know, just the leaves in itself, it's re really dark in, in Jamenton, um, dark green leaves. And it, it yeah, had a real sort of gloomy presence, but yeah, re yeah. a really lovely presence. But just while you're there, Mark, and I'm, I'm coming back to you now, Seamus, just about seeing rhododendron in the wild. That must be just so exciting, seeing them in their native habitat. And, you know, you've seen quite a bit, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean... To, to see them it, there's no there's nothing that, that that's better really mm. uh and, and the amount of information that you get from it and and yeah just such, such an inspiring thing to be able to do and see them um but and see where they grow and how they grow and what they grow with as well um, yeah and you, you must have many wow moments when you come yeah. across something yeah absolutely there's there's um you know, there was one point actually for, for me to make the collection uh, uh road engine and camellia magnolia collection of cinebrina and and one of the reasons going last last spring was to try and see uh some of these uh cinebrinums in in the wild and uh we're on our way to tongri on some uh, extremely um actually i've got a couple of uh pictures here i might be able to share this screen um so there's um Maybe we'll try that. Yeah, a couple of um on a journey onto Tongri and uh the road was pretty dicey. Uh, there was lots of landslips on the way and it was absolutely gushing it down with rain. And uh, we, we got to one point that where the drivers just couldn't go on anymore. Um we got it got too dangerous. So we stopped off and uh literally just as we stopped off, we turned around and had a look at some of the plants, and there, there was a road engine Keezy Eye, which oh. is in the subsection cinebrina uh, and it turned out to be the actually the only cinebrina that i saw the whole trip so luckily that we did stop at that point um and but we did turn back um and yeah one of many one of many tales around um around that's, there. that's really exciting and you Seamus is the what is there anything in the wild that you've just come across this oh, there's loads like Mark actually I could just list and list and list uh -huh. I suppose if I was to pick one actually um there is the white flowered form of rhododendron Kaysange. so rhododendron Kaysange is named for the queen grandmother of Bhutan so I was traveling with a group in 2015 in Bhutan and we saw it in the wild but actually uh, we grow, we've got young plants of Kaysange in the wall garden at the field nursery and they're flowered and it's the typical sort of rose flowered form. But I was um, in Seattle and uh, I was giving a lecture at the Rhododendron Species Botanical Gardens. Steve Hootman has Rhododendron Kaysange album, the white flowered form, which is the dye fur. Mm -hmm. um, so Ken Cox did actually have it available, um, but didn't have enough plants uh, to sell in the year that we were looking for it. Hopefully he'll have it again sometime. Uh, but it's one of the, the big leaf rhododendrons. For a long time, it was mistakenly identified, uh, nobody knows why, as rhododendron grande. So picture this huge uh, tree with great big trusses of white blossoms. Um, it's a lovely thing. I'm really fond of the, the big leafed uh, rhododendron, the subsection grande. Yeah. So if anybody has or would like to donate a plant of rhododendron Kaysange, our album uh, i'd love it uh, it's just inside the main gates of the species botanical gardens it's wonderful and like just to both of you just to applaud you because you know we we take we take we do take a nod to past plant hunters but now it's so exciting to hear present day and your expeditions and is there anything really when you were both out traveling um that you found most challenging I know back in the day, you know, every, you know, we've got GPS, we've got everything now, but with regard to conditions where you were in the wild, what kind of would have really been 
the worst of it. <laughs> Mark, I'll let you go first because there's so many things that you could mention. I don't know. I'd... <laughs> My sanity would be nice at times. I don't, um, no, definitely. The, yeah, the, the, the traveling can get hard sometimes, but, you know, it's nothing to like the original plant hubs went through, but um, you know the long distances and the sort of the bendy roads they start they start wearing you down a little bit um, and, and you sort of get used to so you have somehow get used to the the absolutely stunningly beautiful scenery and and I do have to remind myself give myself a slap every now and again uh, to, to where I am you know and 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 <clears throat> constantly looking at plants and uh, how good altitude mark you know did you have any issues with altitude sickness well, I did. I did get a little bit sort of uh, euphoric at times. Uh, but... <laughs> that wasn't the cinnabarina, was it? <laughs> it might have been, yes. <laughs> but but I think um, you know, no, not with. I didn't get any altitude sickness or anything like that. Okay, so, uh, that was fine for that. Yeah, no, it's just it's lovely to hear the real life story. So do you, Seamus, anything now you'd want like to share? Like I'm sure the best. There's a lot. Uh, it's the creepy, <laughs> it's the creepy crawlies, Mark. You've been to Arunachal Pradesh. So Arunachal Pradesh, it's a really wet climate and it's famous for having 70 different species of leech. Um, <laughs> so uh, leeches, I, actually oh. leeches, they don't bother me as much as they used to. Mm. I remember being, uh, we were plant hunting in Tasmania and we literally the strip off it from hours later, we were coming across leeches and we had gallons of blood in our boots. Um, it's ticks are disgusting creatures and can do a lot of damage and sand flies actually um i traveled with a group in um kachin state in myanmar in upper burma uh, and sand flies I remember some of my colleagues the backs of their legs were stripped you know they, they, they're tiny little insects and they just strip the skin from you so so there's Burma's the probably the worst place I've ever ever been to. There's more insects waiting to eat you up there than, than any place I've ever been to before. Uh, but it's mm. as Mark said, it's the scenery that you see. Mm. Remember being finally getting above the insect area and getting into the temperate zone, standing on a mountain peak, Pungan Razi on the Indian border. It was November. And there was a single species of maple that painted all the mountains crimson, Acer Wardyard, this lovely, lovely, beautiful maple named for Frank Kingdon Ward um, with crimsons and golds. And as far as the eye could see into the horizon, it just painted the landscape. So uh, so it is worth it's worth the scary bends, Mark, and it is mm -hmm. worth the, um, the insects as well for the plants that you see, the people that you see. And it's just to see plants in mass, you know, when you come back home, Places like Minturn and places like Kilmacara, it feels slightly like zoos. You know, you're seeing one of something or five of something, whereas actually you see something in tens of millions in the wild. You know, it's on it's, a, it's on a vast scale, and very often the landscape is completely unspoiled. There are bits of the earth that we as humans haven't wrecked yet. Mm, it must be those wow moments that make up for it all. But just with regard to when you're talking about Minturn and Kilmacara, where are the best places? Okay, we know Mintern and Kilmacurry are the best, but where else, you know, within Ireland and the UK, would you recommend people to go to see rhododendrons growing? Well, for, for the UK, I mean, um, I'm from originally from the southeast, so I know um, the, the gardens over there very well. And, and one of my favourites is actually High Beaches, so where I've worked before. Um, so High Beach is a lovely woodland garden that's uh, in Sussex, and then just down the road. Um, there, there's a National Trust garden, Nyman's, which I actually visited last, uh, I think, a couple of weekends ago. Um, and they've got a lovely califitum, a uh, lovely form of califitum, absolutely lovely, all sorts of lovely things there. Um, but I mean, there's, you know, of course, yeah, Minton, there's, there's, uh, there's a, a subject called garden called Abbotsbury just down the road from where I am. And that's, that's, um, I mean, it's got all sorts of things and, and they can grow lots of different things because of their, lovely uh subtropical climate uh near enough subtropical climate um but then also if we, you know we go we go up north um there's harewood house i would definitely recommend um a yorkshire arboretum and the himalayan garden up there is is absolutely superb um and then if we come back down to the sort of southwest for me there's the national trust garden night's haze which is one of my favorite uh national trust gardens um and of course, you know, 
I mean, there's, there's there's tons and tons, but I'm just just naming a few here. Bodmin in Wales, that's that's an, another absolute favourite there. But there is so many to look for. And interestingly, actually, um, the um the RCM Group have just put on a recommended gardens list on our website, so you can find uh an international range of gardens that are recommended for rhododendrons, camellias, and magnolias. Uh, if you look on our website, and that's a brand new feature on that. Um, so, Seamus, uh, over to you. Yeah, yeah just, just, sorry, just, uh, just, that, just sorry, Seamus. Just I I should have actually said before I said that about seeing you know in Ireland, because we do boast that we have one of the finest rhododendron gardens in the island of Ireland, and I think that's very true of Kilmacurra. Yeah, uh, well, Kilmacar is the oldest uh, mm. rhododendron garden in, in Ireland. So we've been growing rhododendrons for over two centuries. And we're lucky in that uh, we've inherited all these lovely old gardens. So one of the best kept secrets in Ireland is Fern Hill in, in Dublin, which uh, belonged to originally the Darley family. So they received Hooker's rhododendrons uh, from, from Glasnevin. And then it became the, the property of the Walkers. And now it belongs to Dunleary Matt Down. County Council, full of rhododendrons uh, that were originally raised at Bass Nevin. And I mean, there's a bit of stuff you would see on Hill Lane slopes. So there's Fern Hill, um, there is Kilmacurra. Um, then if you pop down to Mount Congreve, Mount Congreve has a staggering collection. So it's the fourth largest collection of rhododendrons in the world, um, the largest collection of camellias in the world, one of the largest collections of, of magnolias in the world. Um, and then a bit like Mark said, there's these sort of regional microclimates. So uh, places like Fota Arboretum in County Cork or Garnish Island in Bantry Bay, they're able to grow a lot of the Madinia uh, subsection uh, rhododendrons. Um, and Northern Ireland actually has a lot of superb mm. rhododendron gardens. Mount Stewart, one of my favourite places on the planet. So that garden was created by Lady London Tree, who... Um, she was a sponsor of the great plant hunters, particularly George Forrest and Frank Kingdon Ward. Pop over to um, Man or to Row Allen in County Down, another great garden. Uh, Brook Hall in Derry, and then in sort of new rhododendron gardens, Paddy Mackey uh, began gardening on Mahee Island, which is a drowned drumlin in Strangford Lock. Uh, that garden is a 35-acre woodland garden. It's one of the best contemporary Irish rhododendron gardens. So the Irish branch, uh, we visited there uh, on Saturday to present the AJ Welly Medal uh, on behalf of the RCMG uh, to John Bolt, a 91-year-old grower. And we got stranded on the island because it's from Kathleen, because of storm surge and high tide. We were stranded on the island for well over two hours beyond the time we were meant to be there. But Ireland, like Britain, is straddled with sort of great rhododendron gardens. Should mention actually that Jack Davies says he sent in the comment to mention. Mm. Her, so of course we should get yeah. yeah. a great park. And then of course in Scotland, Scotland, the west coast of Scotland is just full of great gardens. But one of the great, great, great collections is of course the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, which has always been a world centre for, for rhododendrons. And just while you mentioned Fern Hills, um, Seamus, Fern Hill Silver, rhododendron Fern Hill Silver, do you remember the story about when that was bred and they were so proud of it? Was it the directors in Glasnevin? And they used to walk around the plant. They were so happy with it that they tipped their hat to it. Yeah. It was such a gorgeous tree. They were so happy. Old Sally, <laughs> old Sally Walker told me that. <laughs> Sally was in her 90s and, and she was blind the last time I went to visit her. But she used to send me every year when I was at last night, she sent a postcard and say the rhododendrons are looking marvellous at Fern Hill. Come and visit. So I'd go out and we'd go out together. But I remember when she's still at her eyesight, she told me that walking down the Broadwalk, just the original rhododendron, our boy in Fernhill Silver, that was raised at Glasnevin from Hooker Seed. Mm. So she said that Sir Frederick Moore, when he would visit Fernhill, that he'd take his cap off to it because his father had raised it at Glasnevin and sent it out. And of course, that original plant is there and in bloom at the moment. Yeah, I love that plant. But just while you were talking both about the RCMG group, perhaps you could both you know, talk a little bit about that and the, you know, you being the Irish branch chair, Seamus, and the, I know I'm very fortunate to be a member and being to events and I'm sure Mark as well, you know, so could you just let, you know, everybody who's on just know a little bit more about the RCMG group? 
Yeah, so you, go, I like yeah. you go first. Yeah, Mark, yeah. would you like to talk about that, about, you know, how easy, you know, it is for people to become a member and, you know, you just meet whom I've met on the trips or, you know, it's just wonderful. Yeah, I mean, the the whole RCM group, it's an international group um, mm. and, you know, so it's a worldwide group and and basically the uh it's so easy to to become a member um but not just to become a member to be part of the the group the community that that is the rcmg as soon as you sort of get in you get to one of the meetings one of the garden meetings uh anything involved in the rcmg uh you're suddenly welcomed with full arms uh and, and we'll start talking plants and it's, it doesn't just stop at the road engine camellias and magnolias but we talk about everything um uh, and it is is one of the best places to to share information get information uh and use the resources that we have um for any any plants but especially road engines camellias and magnolias um so if you are interested, then go onto our website, um, which you, you will be able to find, um, and uh, the, go into the membership side of it and uh, and and become a member. It'll be absolutely easy. Yeah, and it's a great online resource. I've used it quite a bit, Mark. There's a lot of information there. Yeah, absolutely. There's so you know, yeah, a big plant database, um, historical database, and like I said just before, there's now a. Uh, a, a new uh, map orientation of where you can get to the best gardens uh, and you know just yeah such a lot of information there uh, and you know you'll be able to ask questions uh, on, on there as well and, and pl plant items as well so that yeah absolutely full of full of information yeah thanks yeah and you Seamus what yeah can you think? yeah I, I would echo exactly what Mark has said. I, I think it's one of the very best groups that I'm a member of. So I'm I'm branch chair of the Irish group. So we're an all Ireland. So we cover the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. It's just a great way of getting um like minded enthusiasts together. You know, so we very often would meet up and we go to. Uh, it's not, of course, just about rhododendrons. It's about camellias and magnolias and and sort of other lovely, luscious woodland plants. Um, so some of our visits in recent years have been to places like Mount Concrete to see the, the staggering magnolia collection there in, in mid-March. You know, last weekend we were in um, up north in Mahi uh, in Strangford Lock and also in Ring Dufferin looking at historic collections. Um, it's also a great way of sort of... Um, Disseminating knowledge. So um, Brexit has been a, a big challenge in getting rhododendrons uh, in various different parts of, of, of Ireland. Uh, so um, we're able to work out and solve those problems on how to get uh, rhododendrons, you know, the sort of choice species that have become difficult to find. The other thing that the Rhododendron Community Magnolia Group do is that they have a great seed list every year. So mm -hmm. it, it is a way that, and, and you know, we're able to tell people a new enthusiasts how to raise rhododendron from seed. Uh, we have a, a great seed list that people can choose from. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a great learning tool, but really actually for anybody who loves the tree mm. genre, <clears throat> Camellias Magnolias, it's just the perfect group to join. And as Mark said, it's not just cross Britain and Ireland, it is international. We've got members right across the globe. Yeah, and I, I'm just I'm conscious of time, but I just see that so few participants have actually left because this Q and A they always are just so wonderful. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much, Seamus, for just your talk. It was absolutely sure. wonderful. And um, Mark, I'll hand back over to you. If there's anything else you would both like to add, but I'm just as I say, I'm just conscious of time. Um, thank, you, thank you both. For such a wonderful evening. Well, I just want to uh, say thank you to everybody who's attended tonight. But actually, I want to say a particular thank you to you, Mark, because you've given over so much time uh, to, to this event and, and you've given over a lot of this evening to it as well. Um, I was lucky I've been to Minturn. I know what a wonderful place it is, but I really do need to get down at Rodendron time. And uh, you always need a face behind a great garden. And of course, Mark, you're the face behind Minturning. You really are doing remarkable work there. But myself and Mary, we're really grateful to you tonight for um, mm -hmm. being the, the face of the Rhododendron Camellia Magnolia group uh, this evening and, and for hosting us.
Well, thank you, Seamus. I mean, I, I, I know how much it, it takes to pull together these talks as well, that, you know, the, the research, the, 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 the finalising and then, then putting it all together is just such a massive amount of, of work, but you clearly love it. Um, and and I'm, I'm from I'm in, in part of the uh, the Ronanjan community and the Magnolia group. But thank you very much. Um, this has been recorded, so it will go on to YouTube uh, very soon. Um, and I think finally, I would like to thank everybody that has attended. Um, it's been really good uh, to see you all here. Um, and I think we shall finish up and say thank you very much and good night. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks.